Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to address this distinguished group. Um, <clears throat> dengue, as you've heard, is the fastest growing vector borne disease globally, but I'll focus this talk on the risks to Europe and to the UK. Uh, these are my opinions and don't necessarily reflect those of the company. I'll set the stage by describing aspects of dengue's epidemiology and bionomics of its vectors, and we'll focus on Aedes albopictus because that species is the dengue vector most relevant to the UK at the moment. I'll conclude by describing newly understood risk factors for severe dengue. There are four distinct dengue viruses, dengue one through four, all transmitted from person to person by the agency of Aedes aegypti, the principal vector, and as you'll hear later, Aedes albopictus, an important secondary vector. The virus also is viable in uh, desiccated, vertically infected eggs. Now, dengue is one of four diseases transmitted anthroponotically, that is from person to person, by Aedes aegypti. Yellow fever is not shown in the, in the figure to the right because its clinical dis um, presentation differs from dengue and the other two, chikungunya and Zika virus infections. Now, these infections typically are self-limited febrile illnesses characterized by rash, musculoskeletal pain, headache, and other nonspecific symptoms. Clinically, the infections may be indistinguishable from each other and more generally from other viral infections. Dengue can be severe, however, in second infections due to an immunopathologic host response due to incomplete cross protection after infection with another of the four viruses. Importantly, in experienced centers, the case fatality rate for dengue is less than 0.1%, but where dengue is not familiar to clinicians, it can be as high as 15%, underscoring the clinical complexity of dengue diagnosis and its clinical management. Now, Aedes aegypti, aegypti is a highly effective vector of dengue uh, virus because it evolved from its sylvatic tree hole breeding sibling Aedes aegyptus formosus to one adapted to humans in the human built environment about 5,000 years ago at the end of the humid epoch in Africa. Aedes aegypti aegypti evolved to use water storage containers to overposit and becoming endophilic, that is dwelling indoors and endophagic, that is feeding indoors. And most importantly, in becoming a specialist in feeding almost exclusively on humans. Commensal, as a commensal, Aedes aegypti uh, is the principal agent for dengue transmission in the tropics and can vector explosive outbreaks, as you've heard recently in Peru. Aedes albopictus, on the other hand, feeds opportunistically on a range of vertebrates, dogs, cats, squirrels, whatever is available. And from the perspective of viral transmission, that means that those blood meals are dead ends. So Aedes albopictus is adapted to forests and its ecotones with rural locations. So in human settlements, it's found in the garden, whereas Aedes aegypti is indoors. So Aedes uh, aegypti is limited to the tropics and subtropics, the upper figure, where temperatures are no colder than about 15 degrees centigrade. Aedes albopictus is adapted to more temperate conditions and has spread from its Asian origins to become cosmopolitan, including continental Europe and the UK. The major differences in the respective ranges of the species are in North America, Europe, East Asia in particular, and Australia. Now these maps from the European CDC show the distribution of various 80s, invasive 80s species, in the upper right is the distribution of Aedes aegypti, which is, you see is, is uh, confined to a delimited area along the Black Sea, and the little panel on the left, Madeira Island. While in the upper right, you see Aedes albopictus is established across a broad expanse of Europe. And then below, other in invasive Aedes species also potentially could transmit dengue, Aedes japonicus, and more likely Aedes coriacus. Both have become established in Europe. It's noteworthy that Aedes aegypti had been present in Europe, but was eliminated after World War II. But on the right, its future distribution is projected to expand significant, significantly beyond its historical bounds with warming global temperatures, including a possibility for establishment in the UK.
As was noted previously, the current documented distribution of Aedes albopictus on the left is more extensive than Aedes aegypti, but on the right, its modeled distribution based on environmental suitability shows that its actual range is likely to be broader, including much of the UK. And looking to the future, within a generation, the range of Aedes albopictus is projected to be greater yet, including areas around a number of UK cities, which I've circled on the right. Now I described Aedes albopictus as a secondary dengue vector, but outbreaks and endemic transmission in locations where Egypti is absent demonstrates its vectorial capacity. I'll provide two examples. In China, large outbreaks of autochthonous dengue, indigenously acquired dengue, occur almost yearly, shown in the red curve on the upper left. The locations of these cases, shown in blue, the bottom uh, left, occupies an area far larger than the distribution of Aedes aegypti, shown in orange at the upper right. What you see is a zoomed in map and the distribution of Aedes aegypti is limited to a small coastal area of Southern China and to Hainan Island. In contrast, Aedes albopictus, represented in green on the, lower, on the lower right, occurs almost everywhere in the most populated areas of China and therefore dengue control is focused on that species. Now, Japan had experienced extensive Aedes albopictus vector dengue outbreaks immediately after World War II, but no autochthonous cases have occurred in recent decades. Thus, an outbreak in the middle of Tokyo in 2014 was remarkable. It illustrates the transmission potential for dengue even in the heart of a modern, mostly paved over city. 160 cases were li linked to visitation to a park where international festivals were hosted early in the summer. It's believed that Aedes albopictus, and you, you see on the upper right, the positive trap sites in Yoyogi Park, uh, that uh, uh, the uh, local Aedes albopictus acquired infection from viremic festival attendees, setting off transmission to park visitors for several weeks afterwards, many of whom carried infection to other points in the city, shown at the lower upper, uh, excuse me, lower right, and beyond Tokyo. Now this map shows the park's location with respect to perhaps familiar landmarks and also illustrates its size and the relative scarcity of vegetated areas in this megacity. Now this brings us to Europe where the public health impact of dengue is mostly among travelers. Acquiring dengue infection is remarkably frequent among travelers to areas where the disease is endemic, up to 6.8% in these various studies. A recent HSA study of samples submitted for diagnosis of ill returning travelers to the UK found that among the more than 53,000 cases, dengue was the most frequent diagnosis. The broader concern, however, for imported dengue is its possible spread and amplification by local Aedes albopictus. Between 2015 and 2019, European CDC reported 1,418 dengue cases returning to locations where Aedes albopictus was present. Fortunately, very few small clusters of local transmission resulted mostly in Southern France, but events in 2022 were remarkable. First, for the number of local outbreaks, nine in different locations in France, and the number of cases, 67, more than all of the other cases uh, in previous years combined. So the growing transmission of dengue in endemic locations themselves, growth of global travel, and increasing range and prevalence of Aedes albopictus in Europe contribute to a growing risk for local transmission and signals the need for improved surveillance and vector control capacity. I'll switch gears now and we'll highlight briefly some risk factors for de deng severe dengue that may not be widely appreciated, but are points that I believe are relevant to a discussion of travelers. Now this figure condenses results from an Imperial College meta-analysis of risk factors for severe dengue. The analysis was particularly valuable because the authors stratified results by age group. For decades, dengue principally was a disease of children, but as you've heard, due to demographic shifts, Dengue increasingly is a disease of adults and older adults. Now in children, secondary infections pose a significant risk for severe disease with a relative risk of 2.78 in this meta-analysis. In adults, 
Secondary infections also increase risk for severe outcomes, but with a lower relative risk of 1.5 that was overshadowed by higher risks associated with a number of underlying conditions, diabetes and chronic heart and kidney disease. Now this shows that in adults, comorbidities are a more significant risk factor for severe dengue than the immunopathologically driven antibody enhanced disease, ADE, in secondary infection. Now we examined these two risk factors, age and underlying disease, in a study of a national database um, in Taiwan, encompassing more than 50,000 laboratory confirmed dengue cases. We showed that chronic disease independently contributed to increased risks for hospitalization, ICU admission, which is a proxy for severity and mortality due to dengue. We examined a broad range of chronic diseases and at the right for mortality, you see the malignancy, diabetes, congestive heart failure, COPD, asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic renal disease, and cirrhosis confers significantly elevated risks for dying from dengue. We also showed that advancing age independently was a risk factor for severe outcomes. Rates for dengue deaths rose with advancing, advanced age and was more than 100-fold higher in the oldest adults compared to 19 to 45-year-olds. The pattern of rising risk in older adults for dengue hospitalization, ICU admission, and death parallels what's seen for other acute infectious diseases, including influenza and COVID. Now, here are observations from southern Brazil showing on the left excess influ influenza mortality by age, and on the right, rates for dengue deaths by age with older adults dying at 50 to 100 fold higher rates than their younger counterparts. The histograms are virtually superimposable, but note importantly, the different scales of the Y axis. Dengue mortality was almost 100 fold lower than for influenza. Now this last slide is a reminder that COVID mortality also increases astronomically with advanced age. In this summary of the US experience over the entire pandemic, deaths in the oldest age group were 360 fold higher than in young adults. There is thus a commonality among dengue, influenza, COVID, and also respiratory syncytial virus, another respiratory infection for which vaccines recently have been approved for older adults, that they are at higher risk for severe and fatal outcomes than the rest of the population. So in areas at, risk for, uh, areas at risk for dengue will expand with the growing ranges of Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, including within Europe. Although Aedes albopictus is considered a secondary vector of dengue, it can be the sole species associated with endemic and epidemic transmission. Other Aedes species also pose a hypothetical risk in Europe. Finally, severe dengue is not limited to second uh, antibody enhanced infections, but also is associated with advanced age and with the presence of chronic disease. Thank you.